everyone, how are you doing today? That's great. Welcome to Balls Falls Conservation Area, right here in Lincoln, Ontario, in the middle of Niagara. I'm so excited to spend this day with you. My name is Alicia, and together we're going to learn more about the incredible power of the 20 Mile Creek, and how it helped us run a very important building here in the village of Glen Elgin. We're going to take a walk through the village and learn a little bit more about the first family who settled here, the brothers George and John, way back over 210 years ago in 1807. Let's learn a little bit more about this village. Come on, follow me. Now, the Ball brothers had to choose to come somewhere that was a very special place because they were industrialists. That meant that they wanted to operate a great big factory. They wanted to make some money. But how are they going to do that in the middle of a pristine forest? Well, they chose this place to settle in the early 1800s because of one very special thing. We're going to hear it in just a moment. But let's take a look at this great, incredible building. Can you see the great big wooden building between those two cedar trees? What do you think it is? Let's go find out. Well, welcome, my friends. Welcome to one of the first buildings that was built here in the village of Glen Elgin. This building opened in 1809. Any guesses as to what it might be? I'll give you a hint. It was kind of like a factory. It was a place that ground grain into something that we use in our everyday homes, in our kitchens, baking, helping our families. It's an ingredient in really important things like bread and pancakes and cookies and cakes. Any ideas? I'm thinking of flour. This mill is kind of like a flour mill. It's called a grist mill. And the word grist, G-R-I-S-T, means grain to be ground. Do you know what type of grains might have been ground into flour in this factory? Good thoughts. Things like wheat and corn and oats and barley were ground down in this building into flour. And this is a very important building because it produced a lot of flour. It produced between 4,000 to 7,000 barrels of flour a year for over 100 years. But back in the 1800s, do you have any idea how they would have powered this mill? Do you think they would have used electricity? I don't think so. Do you think that they used bicycles and used kinetic energy? I don't think so either. Do you hear that sound in the distance? The reason why we are called Balls Falls Conservation Area is because there's not one, but two waterfalls. That's right, the brothers George and John Ball harnessed the power of water to run their mill. Well, my friends, look over my shoulder. Do you see that small hole in the ground that enters the mill? It kind of looks like a dungeon door, but it's not. That's the part of the mill where the water would flow from the 20 Mile Creek into the wheel pit and spin a water wheel, which would spin turbines and power all of the mechanisms of this mill. Well, my friends, we're going to go and take a look at the lower waterfall now here at Balls Falls. We call it Niagara's Other Falls. Come with me, let's take a look. Wow. My friends, look at the rushing, raging 20 Mile Creek. How incredible is that water power? These falls are so loud. Well, in the early 1800s, this would have been a rushing, raging river, and it would have been very powerful in operating the grist mill. Well, let's go and take a look at how that water would go from the falls to the mill. There would have been a dam further up the river, just before the water falls, stopping some water from flowing over the falls and pushing it through this stream right here. This is called a raceway, and the water would certainly be racing very, very quickly through the raceway all the way into the water pit right here. Take a look inside. This is an overshoot water wheel. So water would be rushing in and force itself over the water wheel and force it to spin around and around. 
Wow, that's really interesting. That's certainly some significant power coming from the water of the 20 Mile Creek. Now let's see how the factory operated. Here we are outside of the grist mill. Now I want you to imagine over 200 years ago, farmers would be farming their fields and harvesting grains like wheat and barley, oats and corn, and they'd be loading it into sacks and sending it on their way to the grist mill. Of course, it would be pulled by horse and carriage in a great big buggy. And imagine when they get to the grist mill, where is that grain going to go to be produced into flour? Take a look above me. Do you see that door? I wonder what it's there for. The horses and carriage would arrive underneath that door and there would be a pulley system that would be pulling up those sacks of grain. The grain would arrive on the second floor and then it would head all the way down to the basement where it would be cleaned through a process called smutting. Well, that clean wheat grain, it would be sent all the way back up to the second floor. And that's where the fun begins. Let's head inside and see what happens next. Well, we're inside of the grist mill. It's a little bit dark in here, but you know what? It's lighter than inside most factories of the time. Do you see all of the beautiful windows? That allowed light to be inside of the grist mill. My friends, that grain starts its journey back up on the second floor after being cleaned. And it would be heading down a chute right here. Take a look around. It would head down this chute and into this sieve. It's called a hopper. And from here, the miller would be able to control the amount of grain that was heading down into the grist stones. Now, there are two great big stones that would be spinning. One stone is called the bedstone. That's like this one right here. It's called the bedstone because it doesn't move. It's sleeping. It's doing its job by being stable on the floor. And this great big piece of granite has these striations or lines through it. These are called furrows. And a special person would come and create these furrows so that the wheels, when they're spinning, are slicing and chopping the wheat kernels as they spin. So that's the bedstone. On top of the bedstone, kind of like an Oreo cookie, is this stone right here. It's called the runner stone because it does all the running. It would be spinning, spinning, spinning over the bedstone, going 100 revolutions or turns per minute. That's very, very fast. And it can only go 100 revolutions per minute because of the great strength of the water power operating this mill. So as the runner stone is spinning, it's chopping and slicing those small kernels of wheat. Well, where does the wheat kernel, where does the flour go from there? As the stones are spinning, it's forcing the wheat and the kernel and the flour to go down another chute, all the way back to the basement. There in the basement, that process would begin to send the wheat and the flour all the way back up. It would be heading up a pulley system inside of beautiful cups on a leather strap. And from these leather cups, they would be dumped into this great big machine right here. It's called a bolter. It's kind of like a giant flour sifter. And the bolter would be spinning, spinning, spinning and it would be sifting out different types of flour. In the first barrel, it would sift out white flour. That's the flour that we most usually use in our bread and cookies and cakes. In the middle, it would be sifting out whole wheat flour. That's what we use in whole wheat bread and things like banana bread too. And at the end, it would be sifting out middlings. Out of the very end of the bolter would come the bran. And if you've ever had bran muffins or bran flakes for breakfast, it's sort of the same thing. Well, back in the old times, over 200 years ago, well, people thought that bran wasn't good for you, so they fed it to their horses and chickens. But now we know that it's very nutritious for us. Let's take a look at what that looks like. Well, let's take a look here. This is the white flour that would be coming out of the first sifter. How very fine indeed. White flour would be sent all the way up the St. Lawrence Seaway across the Atlantic Ocean to Europe. In the middle section, we'd be sifting out whole wheat flour. 
Here we have the middlings. And at the very end, as we all know, came the bran. Well, here at Balls Falls Conservation Area, this gristmill is one of only two operating wooden gristmills in all of Ontario. How fantastic is that? We operate it every year around the Thanksgiving holiday. And we make our own flour here, just as they did over 200 years ago. But of course, we can't harness the power of the 20 Mile Creek anymore. You see, humans have had an impact on the way water flows over our land. In the last 200 years, we've lost water power. We operate this gristmill using electricity now. But over 200 years ago, when farming started to be popular in the green belt of Ontario, across areas like Binbrook and Smithville, all the way here to Lincoln, many wetlands were cleared. And that lost the flow of water into our water systems, like through the 20 Mile Creek. Now the 20 Mile Creek only has a great amount of water flowing through it after the winter melt and after a big rainstorm. So it used to be a wetland fed river, but now it's a rain fed river. Well, thank you so much for visiting Balls Falls Gristmill. Take a look at this. This is one of the great barrels that they would have filled with flour and sent all the way to England and Europe. Can you see how big it is? Imagine, this gristmill was producing up to 7,000 barrels of flour every single year. How fantastic. Well, you know one thing that's very interesting is that they were only able to produce flour and use this mill during certain times of the year. Well, of course, if they were using water power, what time of the year do you think they would be operating their mill? That's right, in the spring, summer, and fall. So they wouldn't be working during the winter time. And that's a good thing too, because it's a little chilly to be outside and, and working at that time. But these great big barrels were what made the Ball family so prosperous and that they were able to operate a great village for over 100 years here in Niagara.